everyone. Welcome to Console Room 2022 Satellite 9. This is the Lost Episodes panel, and we are recording this on the last day of December of 2021. So whatever 2022 has in store for us, we don't even know yet. Uh, there's three of us in the panel today, uh, Rob, Greg, and myself. My name is Christopher Bonn. Um, I uh, I'm a lifelong Doctor Who fan, and I wrote about the show for the AV Club um, back in uh, like 2010 to 2015. I wrote about 80 episodes on the classic series. Um, and uh, Rob, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Rob Levy. I've been a lifetime Doctor Who fan, probably since, uh, good Lord, mid 80s. And uh, I have, uh, I write a Doctor Who blog for Anglotopia.net, and I write for NeedCoffee.com and do their Weekend Justice podcast. And then uh, I've contributed to a couple books for uh, ATB and um, Cosmic Press about Doctor Who and other science fiction shows and such things. And I guess I'm next. Uh, I'm Greg Bakken, and uh, I am... Uh, I run a blog, podcast, and vlog called From the Archive, British television podcast. Um, basically, it's just interviewing folks who had influence in early British television and as well as missing British television. I also work for a organization in the UK called Kaleidoscope. It's a British television preservation society. And the purpose of it is obviously preserving and acknowledging all, all forms of British television, but also we go out and we look for British television and return it to uh, where, where it belongs, whether it's the BBC, ITV, or wherever. Greg, you were saying over email uh, last week to me that you had just uh, given something back to the BBC. Yes. That was not Doctor Who. I was just curious what that was. Sure. Uh, so we, I, if anyone has heard, and, and there's going to be some show names that we probably talk about that may be a little obscure to people, but the people who are, who are in it are actually very well known. So uh, there is one that I've been working with UCLA for for about four years, and that's a series called, um, called Hugh and I. And it, it was, it's significant, it's done in the early 60s, early to mid 60s, it's significant because it was produced by David Croft. And for those of you who may know, David Croft produced such great series as Are You Being Served, Dad's Army, Hello, Hello, uh, Come Back, Mrs. Noah, all these amazing programs. And uh, so it's, it's very, it's very, these are very culturally significant and we've known about this episode for a while being in the UCLA archive but they're very very difficult to allow anything out of they have a lot of protocols for a lot of reasons and so it's been it, I took about uh, four years working with them on behalf of the BBC uh, I got permission from Claire who runs the BBC archives to work on their behalf on this and other titles going out there so it's and it's also been a really good year for that series as we'll probably get into a little bit later because there's been more stuff that has been found too. Thank you for asking, Christopher. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, before we get too deep into the weeds, maybe we should talk really quickly about the phenomenon of the lost episodes just in general. Um, I imagine a lot of the people watching know at least some of the problem with Doctor Who uh, that uh, there's almost a hundred episodes that are still missing, but it was. Uh, more than that, you know, if you go back 20, 30 years, um, we've discovered uh, quite a few since then. But <clears throat> the entire reason that they were lost in the first place is kind of an interesting story uh, for those who may not know it. Um, and, you know, just step in and correct me if I'm wrong, but basically the, uh, the BBC and probably other institutions like it had policies in place to reuse videotape, which at the time was extremely expensive. And they weren't necessarily thinking long term about this stuff or even thinking that maybe some of the shows even had uh, future value. So they would, um, they would junk stuff or they would record over it. Um, and then only later on would they, would somebody look back and say, well, you know, we're missing all of this stuff. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the thing, the thing too to keep in mind is that it's 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 complex, and one of the things that is is always difficult uh, for this is to the fact that kind of the right hand wasn't sure what the left hand was doing. You have mm -hmm. and that's built to create television output, you know, and that's that's the ones who recorded on two inch videotape. The, the idea with that was that producers are supposed to sign off before any videotape was wiped over. There was it wasn't necessarily arbitrary or shouldn't have been arbitrary. And then you had the sales department who made the 16 millimeter prints. And those are the ones that uh, that went out to all over the world. That's what gets returned. We don't get two inch videotape returns of Doctor Who because they were never sent out that way to anywhere in beyond on, you know, outside the BBC. So what ends up happening is, and, and there's so much more to this. I mean, rights play a big part of this. They only had, generally, I think they only had uh, broadcasts in one other time that they could run something. Um, if anything beyond that or anything outside the cycle, it had to all be renegotiated. And of course, that was very expensive. Nowadays, there are blanket agreements put into place the moment that anyone signs on anything, VHS, you know, once VHS started, that was a huge part of of creating these more blanket agreements. Really, what should have happened is that you know uh, sales probably should have checked with uh, the VT department or vice versa to make sure before something gets destroyed on either end that a copy was put into place. But that never happened. So mm -hmm. it 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 was just a, a series of unfortunate events that led to these programs being destroyed. And I know that a lot of people always say, well, the BBC didn't have the foresight to save these. And I, I just simply don't agree with that. I think that it's a, it's, it's a tragedy for sure, but it was something that you just had people not necessarily really doing what they should have been doing or getting crosshairs or not necessarily following along with protocol. And you end up having these very unfortunate situations. And real fast, because I don't know if Rob wants to jump in, uh, but uh, the, the plus side to that was when you had someone like Sue Malden come in and was the first BBC archive selector in 1978 benefits us as Doctor Who fans, the one thing that she wanted to do was take stock of the BBC archive. And she chose a couple series as like, what do what's what does their archive status look like? And so she chose Doctor Who as one of those programs. And that started really from 1978 till today, a legacy of like preserving, finding, seeking out Doctor Who all around the world and going back to those archives, going to the BFI, going to all these places that, you know, no one really ever talked to before and suddenly started to take an interest in what was, uh, what was missing from the archive. Yeah, and I think too, another interesting aspect of this too is that at that particular time, the structures uh, for archive departments, you know, you had people in management, but you didn't necessarily have anybody trained you know, on, you talked about the procedures and things, but they had a lot of turnover specifically in that time because Austerity Britain, there was a ton of turnover jobs in lower end TV and media jobs. It just, they'd have people that were there six months, seven months, eight months. So the person who's like, this is really great, don't let it go, isn't necessarily talking much as you said, to the person that's in the actual room. At the end of the day, they're like, well, if I just get all this stuff wiped, my day's done, I'm gone, I'm going home. So I think that is what it is. It's not, I think a lot of people think that, you know, the BBC set out to like devalue this by wiping it. And that's not really the case. Um, and I always think that aspect of it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And as we've alluded to already, the, the problem didn't you know, Doctor Who fans kind of tend to think that it's just a Doctor Who problem, but it really isn't. It affected uh, dozens of, of programs. And uh, Greg, maybe you can give us some direct numbers. Uh, well, but was... you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, like you said, and you mentioned early on, Christopher, that, you know, it wasn't just the BBC that this hit. 
this hit um, ITV and within ITV, you have all of these uh, smaller networks, so to speak, like Anglia and Thames and Granada and all the, you, you'll know those names when you watch some of these British television series because their they're, they're logos were at the beginning of the programs. A ABC, which is not the same as ABC here, were the ones that created the Avengers. So, you know, you have all these, all these miniature archives, all these side archives and they're, they don't have a retention policy either. So they're getting rid of stuff as well. So it's, it's a massive, and it's the same thing with the BBC mostly is that they shot everything like on two inch black and white, either four or five lines, six to five line videotape, made film copies of it. And that's what we get back. You know, like when, for example, the last uh, uh, episode of the Avengers that was returned, 16 millimeter uh, tunnel of fear, you know, that's not on videotape, that's on film. So uh, it's it's uh, really an interesting uh, piece to it. And as Natasha mentioned before we started this, it doesn't, it doesn't just affect British television, it's the US television, it's Canadian television. It, it, it's, we, it's the same story all over the world, really. And it sounds like it was maybe around late 70s that people started to kind of develop policies that would yeah. prevent this from happening. Yeah. So we're talking about probably going back to the late 50s, maybe a 20 year period of this being an issue. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, and from what I understand, um, it's not necessarily just TV. I mean, I know we're specifically going on TV, but they junked a ton of film um, mm -hmm. and a ton of like really great interviews and things. I know with Granada TV, a lot of the footage of like bands performing on Granada, that first Joy Division concert on Granada TV exists because someone else outside of Granada made a copy of it. Mm -hmm. So again, it's very much a labor of love and very much sort of this epic odyssey of trying to find it, you know? And mm -hmm. um, I, I, I know it sounds, I feel, you know, it sounds kind of dirty, but I really love the whole fat, the whole lore of this, you know, just the oral history of a lot of this stuff is incredible. Um, but the, the other thing too, and I think you can comment on this a little bit too as well, is a lot of people think it's, you know, it's science fiction, it's Zed cars or Quartermass or the Avengers or Doctor. There's a ton of really great British comedy of the British comedy legacy that's gone, uh, which I also think is, is kind of really tragic as well. I think we had a question too about Monty Python. Did one of you mm -hmm. guys want to jump on that? Yeah. Um, Mike Rogers, who's listening in, um, asks, is it true that the Monty Python's Flying Circus uh, episodes were saved by the Pythons themselves? Um, I, I believe that is true. Um, I don't have the reference manual handy, but uh... it's partially true, and it's it's kind of everything. Kind of Terry Jones tells a story that makes it look like that that they did do so. It's it's interesting. So, for example, and taking you back a little bit, anyone ever heard of the series Steptoe and Son? Um, yes. A lot of the uh, fourth uh, and. Uh, the fifth and sixth seasons, excuse me, exist on domestic recordings. They're called Shabbat and tapes. They are half inch tapes that they're cylind uh, cylinder sort of uh, roll in and does a recording that way. That's uh, how uh, a lot of like Ian Levine had a lot of his Doctor Who stuff recorded in the 70s. So those are the only versions of the Steptoe episodes that exist. With Python, Terry Jones got the heads up that they're going to be wiping uh, series one and two of uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus. So what they did is they went in and originally the story had been, they smuggle out the two inch tapes and they store them in Terry Jones' basement to make sure that uh, everything is safe. The reality was, is that they made copies on Shabbat and tapes of all of those episodes so that if they were gonna be wiped, they had some kind of record that uh, kept those uh, episodes existing in some way, shape, or form. They would have been black and white uh, recordings by that point then, because that's all that they could have recorded off of. But uh, Michael Palin and Terry Jones, if you ever heard of the series uh, Complete and Hutter History of uh, Britain, that has been decimated by uh, being wiped. And yeah. it, it, just, it just kind of follows the Pythons through all of their programs prior to actually being Monty Python. And I think Terry Jones in particular is like, 
you know, I'm sick of my stuff being wiped and we're going to do something at least so we could have a record of it. <clears throat> um, Rob, you mentioned that you wanted to discuss a little bit about uh, why certain why sometimes people don't want to return material yeah, to I mean, the BBC. Uh, you know, taking this from a Doctor Who end, um, you know, we've gotten, you know, we got a pretty nice stash returned a couple of years ago. Uh, but what was interesting is the whole story about Web of Fear episode three, which um, was believed to be included in that package, but then was pulled at the last minute and believed to be, you know, in the hands of a private collector. And there, there's a common theory that, you know, maybe six to 10 episodes exist somewhere in private collections. Um, and that those were collectors are reluctant to turn over what they have to the BBC because one, they'd be prosecuted or two, they wouldn't get them back. And that's always kind of been this long running story about, oh, those collectors, you know, and I'm, I'm curious since we have Greg here, um, just sort of the whole process of like, okay, I have found this, what happens next? Or, you know, I know the whole, I know there's a process of looking for it. We'll talk about that later, but can you just sort of talk about, okay, we think we found something what do you do with it in terms of getting it to the BBC and then being able to have a right? Or if you have, you know, the rest of the missing Avengers episodes in your home and you want to keep copies for yourself, but give them back to the BB to the, to whoever, um, what are the issues around that? So, and, and, you know, it's, it's a good question in the sense of you, you know, people, people bring up the fact that they're afraid of being prosecuted and stuff. And I'm, I'm certainly hoping that more and more, people who have been, I mean, because this is now this missing episode phenomenon, like you said earlier, has really kind of come to the forefront, forefront over the last 20 years, like become mainstream. And I feel like with finds like Enemy of the World and Web of Fear, that just blew up all over the place in the UK. So hopefully people know that if it's, um, if it's like uh, Doctor Who or something that you're not going to be prosecuted for it. We're going, there, there's going to be an armistice on it. There's, there's people who can step in and help. But if it's Doctor Who, and quite frankly, any BBC material, my recommendation is reaching out to like Steve Roberts of the restoration team. Um, he, is, he is the person that you can talk to. And uh, they, they do this, they have done this so many times that they're able to take that and run it through the system as best that they can. And you know, if you want, uh, if you want the film back, all they want is a copy. That's all they want. They want a digital copy. Down the down the road, they might ask for it again. I know someone like David Stead who had a uh, wheel of. Uh, Wheel in Space, uh, episode three, they've gotten that from him a number of times, you know, so they, it depends on how many times we upgrade our collections, right? So from there, you know, you, the, the, the problem I think we start running into a little bit more and more that we don't know for certain happen with Enemy of the World or Web of Fear is any sort of financial gain from it. And the BBC line is pretty strong. We do not pay for our own material. We do not pay for the, you know, uh, we do not give a finder's fee to the stuff that is returned that once belonged to us. We'll be happy to take it. We'll be happy to make you a copy of it. Heck, some people got a tour of the BBC archive. I think that's what Graham Strong got when he gave them all those audios. Um, but it is, you're not going to get a financial uh, gain from it. And that I think becomes perhaps to some people, they start seeing dollar signs because we all know Doctor Who is really big money now. We know that uh, Enemy of the World and Web of Fear garnered a lot of press. So I think that's something that they have to, the BBC that is, or uh, the intermediaries within the BBC have to be able to caution people very carefully about. And if I may say on the other side of it, greed works both ways. And there is something about having the possibility and folks i've been there having the possibility of possibly having a missing episode of doctor who that you can return and they start asking a lot of money for it and you start figuring out in your mind well what can i sell how can i make it work what can i you know do i need to live in a house do i need a car you know it's all stupid questions like that because there is some sort of real lure to want to return a missing episode of Doctor Who. And it's a scare, it becomes scary when it sets in because it's like, 
how many times you have an opportunity to do something like that. And there's people out there, and we ran into one very recently who is not selling stuff at face value. And if we didn't do our due diligence of checking this person out, we would have lost thousands of dollars or pounds, really. It was, it's, you have to be careful when doing this. Uh, what is the process of finding a lost episode? I mean, I've, there are stories of people of, of, of uh, going to Kenya and going to television stations that have been closed down or theaters that have been closed down and finding them. Right. It's just I mean, look, the, the, whole, I, the whole aspect of it is fascinating detective story to it, me. It is. And I mean, yeah. if you look at, I, there is a lot of detective work in it. And like, if you look at the story of Phil Morris, what he did was you, he had people, he didn't do it himself. He might think, he might tell you he did it himself. He didn't do it himself. Who had people saying to him, we know this is where you do your job. We also know that this is where, you know, certain seasons of Doctor Who had aired. And would you ever consider doing something? He ended up unfortunately becoming a host in a hostage situation for real within his work, ended up getting a big settlement and started using some of that money to fund a search for uh, missing British television with the emphasis on Doctor Who. What he was provided though, from people like Ian Levine and Paul Venesis and other folks was, all of the records for broadcast in those countries. And so he knew where to go to. And the reason why Phil was like, I think this could work was that he knew the people in those countries. And he's like, these people don't throw any, these people in these countries don't throw anything out. They never get rid of anything. So the fact that there might be some film prints still around doesn't seem to be completely Un, you know, illogical. And that's what he did. He did that. And we have other people. You have like John Prettle, if, if that broadcast who, and other things. You have Richard Molesworth. You have a lot of other uh, folks that are, excuse me, lesser known, but like work on the kaleidoscope side who, mm -hmm. that's what they're doing. They're looking at broadcast dates. They're looking at uh, uh, film bicycling dates. And what I mean by that is like uh, one country will, one station in one country will have a film print, they run it, and then they courier it to some other yeah. country. And so they, they check those dates. Where was the last place that this film was seen? And they check it out and they go down to these places and do so. But what is really important that I think all three of us can definitely agree on is you just don't, you know, it's just not Greg Bach and calling up, you know, well, I have done so, but you just don't call up a station in another country. I've never done it to another country and be like, hey, can you tell me if, what Doctor Who you have there? And that's one of my biggest pet peeves because there, trust, I mean, trust us, all of us, right? That you have people who work in the BBC or who work in the restoration team. They've done this stuff. They've talked to these stations. And all we do as the public is aggravate the situation more by just trying to be armchair detectives. And uh, it doesn't mean that we can't go to the people and be go to like Paul Venesis or someone and say, hey, have you tried looking at this? But he, you know what? I'm, I'm a firm believer in leaving it to uh, the professionals. The other side yeah. of it, I don't mean to, I don't mean to uh, dominate, and I'll, I'll be done here in a second, is that um, film prints show up on eBay. Uh, oh, they, yeah, yeah, I was going to get to that, yeah. And we just bought through Kaleidoscope, we bought an episode of Hugh and I, a different Hugh and I than what I was talking about. And when Chris Perry, who runs uh, Kaleidoscope, got the film print, he takes it over to his, uh, our, our uh, uh, telescene transfer uh, person, David Dean. They open up the film print immediately. They're like, this is way too long of a film print to be 25 minutes. What ended up happening was that there's two episodes of Hugh and I in there. So we had within the last month returned three episodes of the Hugh and I to the BBC archive. That was just by chance. But then earlier this year, we were scammed. If, uh, didn't pay a ton of money for it, but we were scammed thinking that we got a early Morecambe and Wise episode. But what ended up happening was we got the film print and it was the reverse. We're like, this looks way too big for a 25 minute, or for a, this looks way too uh, big for a 25 minute episode. And it was actually, an, a different episode from a later date that actually exists already. And on top of that, it had vinegar syndrome on it, which means it's unplayable. It's, it's soup. 
And uh, it's just, unfortunately, I said, but they don't know it yet and they might be watching, but we're coming after them. And they're, they, they've done a lot more than that. And we, we are very well aware of what they're doing. So, and everyone will know what they've done soon enough. So, and there are names that you all know. So this will be interesting. Mm. Okay. <laughs> no, I just think, you know, I think, you know, like if, if you say to me, you know, jo or Joey Casual Doctor Who fan, they're looking for missing episodes. I think there's sort of like this Indiana Jones thing that first comes to their heads where they're like, oh, they're trekking through the jungles of Brazil to find, you know, old TV stations covered with like moss and weeds. And then they open them up and they see what's in the cabinets. And he um, replaces a tomb with a Cyberman box set with a bag of sand and then runs. Yeah, I, but I, I think, you know, I think that I, I, the thing that I, that I hope people understand about this is that it is very much a scholarly endeavor, but it is also a bloodhound hunt in many ways, right? It's all, it, you know, so it's, it's, it's an utterly, I mean, sorry to keep asking a million questions, but it's like utterly fascinating because, you know, um, I think for years until the Philip Morris discovery, everyone thought, oh, the Doctor Who episodes exist are gone or a private collector has them all and we're never going to see them. And now the door has been open, you know, starting with when they found Tomb of the Cybermen and then, uh, then the Crusades. Uh, I think people began to slowly think, well, wait a minute, maybe they all are somewhere. Well, and, and that pivoted it to the other end of the spectrum. And, and also in between those two, which is also interesting, is Ice Warriors, which was actually found yeah. within the BBC, but not in their archive and, and behind, literally behind a filing cabinet. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, you know, they found they find episodes in like a Mormon church. You know, they find them like just all over the place. So the amount of um, just dogged research that people have to do to this. You know, there's people going to estate sales or they're going through their grandfather's film collection and, you know, you're going to people's houses and like, oh, I have this collection of film. And you're like, this is Herbie the Love Bug. This isn't Doctor Who or yeah. this isn't Steptoe and Son or whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's utterly fascinating how this stuff gets tracked down. It, it is. But, you know, also just a little bit of clarification on the Mormon church, though, is like that, that, you, you know, you've ever like gone past like a, a, like a shopping center and there's like store, 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 and then a church and then a yeah. store and a store. That's kind of what that, okay. it wasn't like a church per se. It was actually a place that once was a BBC office. And yeah. uh, that's, but I mean, it is, it's a cool story though. But yeah, it was like, the, once again, though, it's like film prints left behind, just like the Ice Warriors. And it's, it's really, it's really interesting. Like you said, how all these yeah. places, you know, it, it, and also it's a lot of by chance, isn't it, Rob? It's yeah. just like right place. Yeah, and I, I think treating it like, you know, one of the things they started to do is look at this like a library book almost. Like, where did it, where, where was the last time that we saw this book in our collection? Where did it go? And then, okay, we don't have that, but wait a minute. Like, for example, you know, parts, uh, I think what people don't understand is that a lot of the stuff ex has been found in what's known as the former Commonwealth uh, of Britain but also countries in Asia and Africa and, you know, parts of Latin America that picked up their programming in um, like kind of like a syndication. They buy the shows to show them because they didn't make their own enough of their own TV. So a lot of it is stuff that is just like, wait a minute, this aired in Singapore. Let's, I know, I know like Singapore and Hong Kong have been two very big hotspots for trying to find some of the stuff. Um, you know, sort of like, okay, where did we see this last? And then you, you go through the paperwork and you're like, wait a minute, you know, this episode was shown in, you know, Iceland in 1967. Where did it go from there? You know, you, once you have that physical reference point in a digital age, this job is like a million times, and I'm probably uh, oversimplifying, but in a digital age, this job is a lot easier than it was in the 70s when you didn't have computers and ways to store the data of where stuff went and and just the actual process of talking to people uh i think has made this this search for everything you know really really interesting well and we didn't know about ty until phil yeah, morris yeah. you know that's the funny thing i mean to your point we didn't know about certain things at least i didn't i don't want to speak for everybody uh, but the idea that there was a kind of a separate sort of entity separate from BBC sales that also worked with BBC sales to get BBC material and other 
not just BBC, but other uh, programs out, especially in Africa, that this was this was mind blowing to me. And uh, just I think to your to your point, Rob, I think that I don't think we can ever be surprised by finding out new information, can we? Yeah. Um, Greg, can you talk a little bit about um, the process of going? Because I, I know one of the issues they were talking about years ago, they were talking about trying to go to the Sudan, for example, to see what was there, or Rwanda, and some of these places that like you really kind of can't go to, right? Um, I know there was some interest in trying to get into Syria and see what's there. Um, how does that sort of process hurt somebody from finding missing episodes of Doctor Who or Steptoe or the Avengers or Zed cars or whatever? How does that affect that? It's, it's you know, it, if it's closed off to the West, you know, if it's closed off to, you know, anyone outside their borders, it's impossible. I mean, you could, you could mm -hmm. ask like, like, you know, the, the big, the big, uh, the big story in the eighties when people would say, uh, oh, uh, we called up a station in Iran and we asked them if they had any doctor who, and they said, who in the name of Allah is that? Well, that's not a true story, even though we've heard it for years and years, but it's very similar to that where it's like, listen, you know what, we, this is not important to us. They, they don't have, they don't have to respond to, uh, the BBC or anybody. So it, it, it starts to also become like, well, are we going to get a government change at some point? Are we going to get, you know, it, it's something else. And, you know, it's so hard and I, and I don't mean to be that guy, but it's, it is kind of hard when it's like, I'm thinking about, I want to get these Doctor Who episodes back. But meanwhile, this country is falling apart because of yeah. how horrible people are and stuff. And it's like, it becomes kind of like, almost like, well, if it's there, maybe someday we'll get it. Um, you know, you hear about Syria, I think it was Syria where, or it was Cyprus, it was Cyprus where I think that uh, some of like documented that some of the Reign of Terror episodes were, were definitely there and as well as some other programs and place was bombed and they're gone, you know, it's just gone. It's, it's, it's just, I, it, unfortunately, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, up to how the world works at the moment. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's just, yeah, I guess I, I don't know if there's a better way to answer. At least I don't have. No. One. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of, I think a lot of people just assume that, you know, just going to walk in and, and get stuff and it kind of doesn't work like that. No. Um. And, and it's, it, it's also to the point too, it's like, like I mentioned earlier, UCLA, they're in our country. They are working with, and, and you would have thought I would have been able to smuggle Jesus's body out of the tomb, then get this episode of Hugh and I, because it, they, the, the barriers that they put up, against you know us getting it out and i had the bbc behind me if i don't have them behind me who else am i going to have behind me that actually that that actually cannot you know authenticate me working for them that was really you know it's like no matter some some are really easy to get into and some are just horrible but they have they have the protocols it's just how it works mm -hmm. yeah um christopher um, go ahead oh yeah go ahead um i was gonna ask you but I know if you want to jump in and say something else, and that's totally fine. Um, what's I know we've been talking about other other the semantics of this, but what but missing Doctor Who stuff are are you excited about finding if they should ever find it, or what do you you know want them to find? Well, I mean, the stuff that I'm interested in uh, is things like the Daleks' master plan. Yeah, um, I think everybody, you, you know, I think I, I, I don't think I have any particularly ob obscure <laughs> um, wishes here. I, I want to see the big stuff. I'd like to see everything. Of course, I'd like to see, you know, the Highlanders, um, things like that. But uh, um, Marco Polo has always been a particular interest just because it is the, the first one that's missing um, and it's completely gone. It's such a critical early point in the series I'm fascinated by how the show evolved over time and that first year is you know a, a, a crucible of how the show evolved so yeah um, I think you know I think I'm with you with with uh, master plan I think everybody and their brother wants that and uh but I, I think Highlanders is the other one besides Marco Polo I think those some, seem to be the ones everybody wants um I'm just kind of figuring, you know, I don't necessarily 
think that it's for me the concern about finding missing things isn't necessarily uh, collectors or things like that. But I, you know, to a certain extent, we're in a race against time with mm -hmm. film and and, and yeah. video and how long it lasts and degrades. Yeah, um, that is my big concern. You know, um, if it's in a temperate climate, then I then I freak out a little bit more. Um, you know, but if, I, I would love there to be a stash of Doctor Who episodes buried in Antarctica or in, in the polar ice cap, like there were like a trove of silent films, uh, but it's not gonna happen. So I guess we're all left with wishing, you know, it's just kind of, um, it's interesting. And one of the great things I think about this panel is we're kind of separating that line between wish list and fantasy and how this works, you know, mm -hmm. because I think we talked about this a little bit, Greg, in our, in our prep, um, there is kind of this line you walk when you talk about the missing episodes of anything, not just Doctor Who, but you start talking about the audio versions of it or still pictures from it or other archive thing and then, then, then the actual search for it. So I think when you talk about missing episodic television, you almost have to make that, make that delineation. Um, once you find something, Greg, like if I, if I were to like hand over a complete copy of Celestial Toymaker to you or the, or the Peter Cook Dudley or some Peter Cook Dudley Moore stuff, what happens then? I mean, do, does, uh, do you hand it over to like a, I mean, obviously because it's cataloged and there's a lot of negotiations and stuff, but how does it get, how do, how do they figure out the conditions of the sound and the picture and how do they get it all ramped up and, and things like that? Well, first of all, if, if you wanted to hand something over to me, I would just tell you to talk to Steve Roberts directly because there's, yeah. because. You well, should, it's figuratively, I don't yeah, have it. No, I know, but, I know, but I just, yeah. I want to make sure that people, yeah. that people, it's, that's, that's the fun, right? To be able to have, make sure your name's attached to it. But absolutely what they do is like, as soon as they get it, they're going to go and they're going to, they're going to run, run the film, or at least first probably check to make sure the film can run. You know, they're, you, you're going to be able to tell immediately upon opening the can, is there something wrong with it? Is there, is there, is there a vinegar smell? You're going to, you're going to know it yourself, obviously. But that's the, the panic. That's the thing that drives me nuts. It's like, I don't want to open this, but I do want to open it. And it is like one of the most frightening things in the world. Cause you're like, okay, what am I getting? You know, actually, could we, Let's talk about the technical aspects of that for a second, because I know with yeah. old old film stock, a lot of that stuff has been lost because the film stock is literally flammable and would, you know, mm -hmm. burn up and go up in flames. Um, when we're talking about this kind of material, uh, what are the what are the dangers in having it deteriorate over time yeah. and stuff like that? What kind of a clock are we under? It depends on how it's being stored, you know. Um, I think they were worried with enemy and web and Joss because that was a humid, hot climate. And it was, it, it, they, I think it was said that, that they were worried about some of the prints. And the funny thing is, luckily, at least as far as I'm concerned, you look at the prints and I don't know, do we have, do we have a web of fear over here yet on? Uh, yes. Uh, do we have it over here now. Oh, wait, no, I don't, I don't believe we do. With the, with the episode three animation, um, the, these look amazing on Blu-ray. These look absolutely stellar. I mean, I cannot wait for the black and white box sets to, to, to be made. Um, so whatever, whatever form of de, uh, decomposition that these prints are in, they were able to turn it around really well. Uh, but, you know, for example, something like uh, Galaxy 4, Episode 3, Airlock, and Underwater Menace, Episode 2, they were found in private collectors' hands. So they were, they were kept in very good condition. They had wear and tear from being played on a projector. And every time you play on a projector, you have problems. <laughs> Just like look at Episode 3 of the Faceless Ones. It had a lot of damage to it because it had been played so many times by people who didn't know how to use a projector. So, you know, those are, it's not only just how it was kept, but how people play it and how many times they play it and do they play it incorrectly. And like, if I got a film print, I'm not going to be playing it on a projector because I think it'd be cool because I would probably ruin it. Luckily, I mean, I think we all have access to this in some way. You have to pay for it. But I, I know people in the former industry I worked in that could transfer it for me if I need to or something. And everyone can find people who do that sort of thing now. They're popping up all over the place. That would be my recommendation. If anyone found like a can of film, they want to play it, spend a little bit of money and get it transferred by a professional first. And I would also say 
do that if you do feel like you have something that's worthwhile before you hand it off to the BBC, before it goes on to any sort of FedEx or something international, get a copy made, you know, pay the money, get a copy made. So if something were to happen to that, you're like, you do have, you do have a copy for yourself. How long does videotape last? I mean, uh, you know, with a book, obviously you can keep a book around for hundreds of years if you have it in the right conditions. Um, but when you're talking about these more modern technologies, um, some of them, I think, uh, people aren't necessarily used to seeing an end of life point for that because they're so new. Um, do we have, you know, is this something where we maybe have 20 years before the actual tape starts to degrade so much that we can't save it? I would, I would say, and I, I, Rob, if you wanted to jump in, I don't mean to talk. No, over. no, no. You're the one that you, I'm, I'm, you, you're in the trenches with this. So yeah, by all means. So what, I mean, it, once again, it kind of comes down to how it's stored and whatnot. I mean, look back to like, there's, there's videotape, two inch videotape recordings from the 1950s. They're kept stored pretty well. They're still around. They, they, you know, they, they play as well as possible. You know, look at something like uh, The Curse of Peladon, episode three, which was falling apart as it was being, you know, played and transferred. And then they had to bake it, basically put it in the oven to bake it for a little bit so that it could unspool. That's you know? so fascinating. See, see, I love stuff like that. Right. I mean, and it's, and you look at it now, and in my opinion, based off of the DVD of the story, I think episode three looks the best out of all four episodes. And that's because they put so much work to make it look as good as possible again. Um, and then for Kaleidoscope, you know, everyone thinks of like British television as being all these grandiose, wonderful stories. But what Kaleidoscope does is it takes domestic recordings from the 70s and 80s and 90s and they'll take the tapes and they'll go through them and people's tapes last from the 70s some don't some get mold on them it, once again it depends on if they were stored in like an attic that was wet or a garage that was wet or if they actually kept them in the house and that they were kept you know taken good care of. Ed Straddling is also someone, you all know that name because he produces mm -hmm. some of the greatest documentaries for the range. Um, he also, it's called TV Heaven. He gets videotapes from all over the place and he will document them and transfer them. And, you know, his goal, just like Kaleidoscope, is to find missing material. And sometimes that missing material just might be a BBC ident or a weather uh, update or something like that. And I know that I always think of like the Avengers, Doctor Who, all these great stories, but this is truly British heritage. This is yeah. truly the culture. Yeah. I mean, there's all these, like the, the thing that people forget too, is that there's all these great like productions of theater that were aired on TV and, you know, documentaries. And there's just a lot of really fascinating stuff there you know i mean we always think of like zed cars or quarter mass and you know the avengers and doctor who but like just the amount of stuff that's missing um is pretty incredible we actually had a question um here mm -hmm. uh it said what have some of the greatest recoveries of missing british television been uh and either from the perspective of the craziest recoveries or from the perspective of amazing television I mean, for me, and I don't deal with this every day, finding uh, Tomb of the Cybermen is the first time I remember them a as a fan in real time hearing about they found something that was lost. So for me, that, that particular moment's really special because it's like, hey, they found this, right? And then the other one is Enemy of the World mm -hmm. because everyone thought, you know, for reading the Target books and stuff, it was just this dry, really uninteresting episode and it's completely different. Um, it turned all, out to be one of my favorite Troutons, actually. Yeah, and I think that the the Avenger stuff that they the, that's missing that they're finding, I think, is far more entertaining um, than people had initially thought. So I think that's where I lie on on that in terms of being television and stuff. But that's sort of you know I think uh, unless we're Greg, um, you know, a lot of the memories of finding or hearing about finding missing things kind of touches us on a fan level, but not necessarily an occupation. Or profession level so um that's just kind of what excited me mm -hmm. um i would be excited i've mentioned this before that the dudley cook peter or dudley more peter cook stuff i think is just i really want to see that 
Um, and I want to see some of these like, like television theater things that they did, you know, which is like one hour dramas of just stuff and it's bonkers. You've got like literally a who's who of British television theater and film doing stuff, you know. Um, that's kind of what I get excited about. Um, like you, I was ex really excited to hear about Enemy of the World and Web of Fear, um, in part because, you know, it, it, I come at this from more of a fan perspective than, yeah. than like Craig's professional perspective. And I was just amazed that even at this late date, we're still finding stuff. And it, uh, not only was it really exciting uh, to have those particular episodes, but just the idea that this is still, you know, we can still find more of these. This is an ongoing thing. Um, and, um, you know, the more I found out about the, about the issue, uh, you know, spreading past Doctor Who, um, I'm really interested to hear about, you know, more of the, I'd, I'd like to see a lot of those plays that you just mentioned. Um, you know, that's a fascinating period of, and I think, of TV. And I think too, the people that like, Doctor Who also have a cross interest in wanting to see a step toe and son. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think likely is likely lad still missing. There, there's some right? episodes, there's some episodes still let missing. Yeah. Yeah. Like likely for me, I want to see those. Cause I saw one episode of whatever happened to the likely lads yeah. on a plane. Um, and I'm like, Oh my God, I want to see more of this and I can't find it anywhere. You know? So that's how I found out that was missing. But like, I'm interested in a lot of that kind of stuff. And um, just, you know, there. I think people that are interested in one are kind of interested in the other. You know, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of kind of cool. I think Doctor Who is the gateway drug into British television for a lot of people. I think my find that I find that I I'm still excited about um, that we haven't seen a ton of actually yet. I think it was in 2007 that uh, the Library of Congress. They found in the Library of Congress something like 70 some, to your point, Rob, British plays that had aired over here in the 60s and early 70s yeah. uh, that were missing. And one of them that really is one that I, I'm hoping gets a release soon is the 1965 version of George Orwell's 1984. Uh, there was the Peter Cushing version in 1954, but this one was done in 1965. Part of Theater 625 is the name of the, yeah. the show that it was on. Um, and that was thought to be lost. And that was a huge fine. And what I also loved about it is that the Library of Congress, like UCLA, is not going to let every anything out of their archives. So everything was, uh, was transferred via FTP to the BFI. And uh, that was that was like one of the first of its time of such mass amounts of material in in broadcast quality, and that was really exciting for me. Yeah, I watched a documentary last month on uh, restoring like silent film from around the world and different film from around the world, and like Nigeria, who has this leg this filmmaking history, is finding a bunch of their films that have been previously thought missing from before you know 1950s from the 50s, they're finding them in like Romania, the Eastern Bloc, you know? So where this stuff turns up is not a unique um, thing for Doctor Who. But, you know, I think it's interesting because the, uh, like you might be looking for Doctor Who and you might be looking for this, but somebody else is out there looking for like the missing Magnum PI tapes or something, yeah. right? And the process is still the same. And I think that having a uniform process now with institutions and countries and things of how to do this. Although it helps for you, because you just have a direct, you know, you have a bat phone, so to speak, to, uh, to these folks. Um, I think that really helps streamline the process. So it's probably a lot easier now to find something. Well, and one of the things too that's helped too was getting like BBC help. And I wasn't involved with this, but I certainly know about it with Kaleidoscope is Kaleidoscope finding sensor clips like they did for Doctor Who, but they found them for like, if anyone's heard the series Callan, uh, starring Edward Woodward, um, as well as uh, the Peter Cushing Sherlock Holmes. Uh, yeah. Some of that was found in Germany. And so like, even though they're not full episodes and we always, I always assume, like I always think of clips with Doctor Who and stuff, that this stuff is really turning up for all sorts of places, including like we found one a couple of years back for at that point, a missing episode of Till Death is Do Part. 
which of which is interesting because the episode was then found it didn't have that clip in it because it was censored out we had the censor clip but network released it without I mean, we offered it to them they didn't take it so the episode that's on the blu-ray does not have that clip in it so it's incomplete and that's a real bummer because we offered it to them and they didn't they didn't take it i do think it's it's uh quite funny sometimes that the only parts of an episode that survive are the censored parts. It's like, <laughs> gotcha. <Yeah. laughs> they're, and they're kind of depressing to watch, aren't they? It's killing. <laughs> People screaming and killing. <laughs> I can't do that. I, I, you know, I'm really curious too with when people talk about, you know, the this, this subject of lost and found and, you know, kind of circling back to Doctor Who, I think, you know, the one thing that people, I think as they sort of discover this more is that the process of looking for it, the process of finding it, and then the process of getting it out there are all way more time consuming than people think. I think, you know, in such an instantaneous culture, we think, hey, I found the abominable snowman. I'm just gonna turn it in. They're gonna go and fix it. And then they're gonna put it on DVD a week later, you know? Um, so I think sort of breaking that down into how that process works is really great. Um, how has the technology affected this? I mean, obviously being able to clean up a print, you know, you mentioned before is, is great, but how much can they do and what can't they do? Well, the, the, thing, the thing is, uh, like you look at, say, Enemy of the World and the Web of Fear, um, you know, we, we found out about it on, what was it, October 8th or 9th of uh, 2013, and it was all ready to go. It was instantaneously there for us, which it's never been, I mean, who would have thought, right? But in reality, if I'm not mistaken, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, work did not start like i don't think the prints were handed over to anyone attached to the restoration team until i think march of 2013 yeah. so all that time work was being done on them and uh i it, as far and and who knows how long phil had those prints before that because there's a lot of different ideas of how long that those things have been hanging around but you know the the thing too is um what can be done on it i mean it, i it's a good question and i i don't know if we really know the answer to them because there's like for example the crusade episode one the lion they have that tram uh uh, constant tram scratch going all the way through and on the lost in time dvd it's been fixed to a small degree it's been like blurred out now um how much can they fix it i'm sure it's going to be much better but i bet it's still going to be there i think there's certain things that just still cannot be fully fixed um if you look at say the tomb of the cybermen from the time it was released on vhs it had a lot of off locks had a lot of uh weird sort of like breakups, especially when uh, the Cybermen were uh, coming out of their tombs at that, that, that snow animation. I think that's actually episode four when they're going back in to the most re recent revisitation DVD. They've made leaps and bounds on it, but it's still not perfect. Or War Machines that has a lot of uh, technically difficult things to it, but it's still a hundred times better. You know, I, I like to, pre I'd like to think, I don't know about you two, I'd like to think that they can do anything now, but I don't think they're quite there yet. Yeah. I guess it really depends on what the specific issue is. And I think it also depends on the source material too, I guess. Totally. Yeah, Cause yeah. having something on film, like having Space Pirates episode two on film is a boon for trying to preserve it compared to having it on, on, on a tape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was broadcast from film. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, that and like Wheel in Space episode six and um, like a, a, a Dalek Invasion of Earth. I mean, if they all looked like that, if they all were taken care of like that. I mean, those are just immensely beautiful. They look amazing. Yeah. Technically, speaking of missing episodes, technically something like Power of the Daleks episode six should exist because that was broadcast from 35 millimeter film. That was put in a separate, uh, library than all the videotape episodes and those should there's no reason why those shouldn't exist but 
as we know, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the other thing too, um, when you talked about this a little bit, you know, we, we, we circled back to technology and things a little bit. When they, they know that something's out there and they're looking for it, um, how's, how is stuff prioritized? Or do you just not have that much to do and you just go? <laughs> I mean, like if you have an episode of Doctor Who to find or an episode of you and I to find, you know where they both are. You have people that are interested in both. Do you do, can you get both or do you, can you, with resources, how does that, how does that stuff get made? Yeah, you can get both. Absolutely. It's all a matter of who, you know, get help people work and stuff. I mean, I, I would guarantee, you know, because if someone, if someone said to anybody, if it was Paul Venesis, if it was Kaleidoscope or anything else, we have some, we have, we think we have a Doctor Who episode you'd be interested in, interested in. They'd probably just get up from wherever they are and just get in their car. Mm -hmm. yeah find it you know go to that person if they could you know that i and you know whether i like it or not because i look at british television as a whole doctor who is always going to be like oh you got a doctor who i'll be right there oh you live in america yeah i'll be there though don't worry about it um yeah. it's but but you know it's all a matter too of who wants to talk it's always about negotiation it's always about you know when when you go to somebody and you're just like well i um I, I have, I, I want to get this from you. What do you want it for? Like I said, the BBC won't pay for it. Doesn't mean other people won't pay for it. You know, it's just to be able to return something, you get a pool of people together and they might put in money to buy a, a film print just so yeah. that they can have it and they can return it. It doesn't mean that the person who originally owned it doesn't get credit. It's more like we're just ensuring that it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a matter also of like, if we do it that way, does it, do they want too much? Is it worth it? We got to take a look at the film print first. Um, but as far as like we, you know, I don't think if there's something that's missing out there and there's like a few of them at one time, I think anybody who is working in this area is going to find a way to get everything. Yeah. And uh, one of the things, Christopher, you might remember this too. A couple of years ago, um, it was almost as exciting as them finding a missing episode. They, there was, and it's on one of the DVDs now, but they found an interview with William Hartnell after he left oh. the show where he talked about his time on Doctor Who, which for me was like, this is a gold mine because it's just yeah. a, something you never had. How much of that stuff's out there? That's a good question because that stuff that, that wasn't, wasn't, uh, it wasn't documented in the, the programs that, that they were a part of, you know, no one, no one could see like, oh, this interview, this program has interviews by this person, this person, this person. It's just by people like Andrew Martin at the BBC. And I don't necessarily know if Andrew was the one who found it, but people like him who just, and they're off time are going through things in the archive and are just like documenting stuff because there was no documentation. That's how, he found uh, the the trailer for episode one of Power of the Daleks that no one even knew existed. Yeah, and that's the same with the Hartnell stuff. Like, oh gosh, where did this come from? And it's after he's done in the role. It's incredible. I think it's the only thing we have of him really talking about it after he left too. You know, now it's commonplace, but then you know, not really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too that I that I think is has really helped with archive stuff is that because of preservation we've been able to see the actors from Doctor Who in other roles. Mm -hmm. um, not, not just Doctor Who, but like, you know, other other shows as well. And I think that's sort of another sort of um, spasm that us, us uh, fans of Doctor Who have is that we get really excited when we hear, you know, oh, this guy who is, you know, Ben Rowe the Heretic in the Rivalist Operation is in this weird, just found up, you know, we we are interested in that because we're, we're wired different. Um, mm -hmm. But I think how it all, like there is that cross pollination you mentioned. But I think that, you know, finding like interview clips and stuff for me is just as golden as mm -hmm. finding the episodes. Um, we've got we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I, I think maybe we should uh, see if anybody else that's listening has any questions. Uh, let me open it up to anyone yeah. else if you want to weigh in or if you have something you'd like to ask us. And I was just going to say, well, that showed up there that real fast that we found that with other people, like through like either radio interviews or like audio recording, people did a lot of recording of uh, of audio of television in the 50s and 60s. 
and and 70s like of Arthur Lowe from Dad's Army uh, an interview that no one's ever seen before a lot of missing like they did with the Doctor Who episodes a lot of missing soundtracks and I'm hoping that Quatermass experiment someday gets found that way because we know that they didn't record anything past episode two but maybe somebody at home recorded the original off-air uh broadcast of them and maybe someday that might show up i doubt it but you never know because qu- that was actually a live uh a live performance all all three of the serials were but this one only first two episodes were documented they thought that the quality of the recordings were so poor that they didn't go on after episode two <sighs> and of course now we'd take anything <laughs> we'd take any- just to see it yes um I think we've got, um, we've just got a couple minutes left. Um, if we want to learn more about this, how can we find, um, how can we find you guys at console room or uh, maybe on the web, um, any more resources about the topic that people can look at? I know you've got uh, your blog and uh, maybe Kaleidoscope has a, a website that we can look at. Absolutely. Uh, you can go to Facebook, look up Kaleidoscope. Um, you'll be able to find it. It's, their logo is a K. The best way to reach out to me, I think, because I post a lot of like TV times and radio times stuff and other things over the over the course of the week is uh, at from the archive on Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. And then you can see all my other stuff as I post there as well. Sounds good. Uh, well, I think... Um... Does anyone have any last thoughts before we wrap up finally? No, other than I, like all of you, want them to find as much Doctor Who as they can. If not, you know, if they find something else that's adjacent, Doctor Who adjacent, um, great, awesome. Because I think they find one thing, you know, I think the other thing too is that if they find one thing, if they find a British comedy serial that has nothing to do with Doctor Who, it gives hope for all of us because every single thing that is found means that all hope is not lost. So as long as they keep finding something, not just Doctor Who, but anything, that I think opens up more and more doors um, and also breaks down that barrier of people being afraid to turn things in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I just want to say, I think the whole process of people finding not just Doctor Who, but all of this stuff, uh, it it gives me a really hopeful feeling, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, maybe finding things to be hopeful about is not so easy and this is one of those things that makes me uh feel like uh humanity is <laughs> able to go in the right direction uh because we're archiving things we're preserving our history and uh you know remembering um, and i think that's extremely important and, and inspiring cool. well um we will all be at console room i believe in person um in just a couple of weeks uh, i will so, not but you guys have oh that's right you're in st louis I, was, I, I would totally go but it's a little weird getting you can't get there with a straight flight from here and mm. things are a little nuts here but i'm going to come next year we'll try and uh make a tardis ride available for you next time yes yeah. <laughs> all right well thank you everybody uh thanks to greg and rob and uh, everyone that's listening and we'll see you around the con <laughs>